He came unto his own, and his own received him not. John 1, 11, your fellow redeemed. We are moving to the culmination of the history of really the universe and mankind in particular. The greatest events, these events have been echoed now for over 4,000 years. They would soon take place. This is the moment that creation has been eagerly anticipating since man stepped outside of his relationship with God the Father and broke from him and brought ruin, destruction, sin, and really the image of the devil upon the world and its people. Here, the events that have been happening are the events that we are told angels in heaven are stooping down to look into because they are so spectacular what's happening here. We're about to cross the threshold, the threshold where prophecy is becoming sweet and amazing fulfillment and salvation is ours. Only those who should have known this, those who should have seen this coming and had every advantage you could ever ask for, were totally missing it. They were God's people, chosen to be his representatives to the nations, to instruct people on what to look for when the very long-awaited promised Messiah would come, but they missed it. So in our sermon text series here in Matthew, we're looking back to the events on that past Sunday, the Palm Sunday. We are in Holy Week, as we affectionately refer to it as, where Jesus here sharing with the people he is the promised divine messiah but he's only recognized by a few roundly rejected by the many including the religious authorities there's a pattern here the pattern is clear jesus is moving to the cross to earn the salvation of all people all people all the events that were expected of the messiah had been foretold long ago clearly laid out by the prophets we can go all the way back to adam and eve promised a head crusher who would be a descendant of the woman they have been right in front of them the savior is coming to destroy sin death and the power of the devil and bring us back to the father in heaven sad though you see cold rejection of the messiah you see a flippant attitude towards him as in i've got other things to do i don't need to be bothered with this whole jesus thing right now you see people pushing him away and if we're going to be honest about this i mean really honest about it it would be overwhelming and absolutely totally depressing even in our lives when when people we know love and care about reject jesus the messiah it would be overwhelming and really too depressing to even probably want to go on if not the lord had told us this is going to happen the lord has laid it out i will be rejected people will push me away. They will receive me not, as the King James translates there in John 1.11. In the face of such horror, when you meet such an, again, overwhelmingly depressing situation, our natural tendency is to probably recoil back, to just retreat into ourselves, into our own little world, and, and then shed a tear for it. But we don't react that way. We don't react that way because Jesus did not react that way, knowing that many were going to reject him, knowing that they were going to put him on the cross to get rid of him, to kill him, so they could go on with their ways separated from him. So Jesus faces this. We face things. Jesus assures us, as you are facing these things, including the sad rejection of him, Jesus says, I am with you. You're not alone. And when you stand in me, you always win. When I walk with you, you will always be blessed, even if the world, or it doesn't seem like it, When you're with me, you will always come out on top. You will be the victor because I am the victor, a victory that we see so well on Easter Sunday. So Jesus went forward knowing he's going to die, knowing that he is going to be shut out from the presence of God because a holy, just God cannot abide sinners in his presence. Jesus knew that he would lose and be separated from the Father in heaven who he has enjoyed being in the presence of since eternity. That separation would come to an end when he's on the cross. He became our sins for us. He took his righteousness and he puts that on us. He credits it to us. He reaches out to us and says, I have saved you. I have done what you can't do. I want you to come back to the Father. 
to be with me. Yet, Jesus is rejected. And in the face of rejection, what does he do? He continues to reach out to those who are rejecting him and are rejecting him of the most aggressive means possible. So this morning's text, we go into the third parable. The religious leaders, they're not just questioning Jesus. They're trying to find a ground to kill him. They're done with him. They're sick of his interference. So with time drawing closer, and we kind of probably have all experienced this in life, when a big event is drawing closer, it just seems like time is accelerating as you are moving closer and closer to that event. Everything seems to speed up, speed up, speed up until finally you hit the event. So Jesus tells these parables. Back in Matthew 13, Jesus taught in parables. The disciples said, Jesus, why are you teaching in parables? And Jesus gave this brilliant answer. This is a brilliant Jesus answer. He says, hearing you will not hear, and seeing you will not see. Now, it's by God's grace, and it's the work of the Holy Spirit that we believe, that we see, that we hear. Jesus has been speaking about the kingdom of God, and we know only about the, about the kingdom of God because the Lord has revealed it to us. We see the sad reality. Those who reject the kingdom of God, it's removed from them. They get what they want. No Christ, no kingdom, no God. Yet those who believe it is by the grace of God that they are called into the family and into the kingdom. With that in mind, then I invite your attention to Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for a son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited. See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, the other to his own business. And the rest seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. He sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go out in the highways, and as many as you find, invite them to the wedding. So the servants went out in the highways and gathered them all together whom they found, both the good and the bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to them, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. These are the very inspired words of our true God. What a blessing it is that the Lord would see fit to reveal to us such words of truth that are always right, and he gives them to us to guide and direct our thoughts and our actions in these turbulent and uncertain times. And we know that the Holy Spirit is loose and active through the word of God. And so we pray that he would direct, instruct, and inspire each of us this morning. To that end, we pray. Sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. So Jesus begins this parable with the wedding feast. In ancient times, in those cultures, especially the Near East, and I would say in particular Israel, feasts were a big deal. Feasts were a big deal. In fact, you looked at your calendar, and there were fixed feasts on there, and you marked the calendar. This is a big thing. Not going to miss this. So there were fixed feasts, sometimes religious, sometimes ceremonial, sometimes both. Then there were occasional feasts that came up. Now, the number one occasional feast that would come up would be that of a marriage feast, a, a marriage celebration. We see that through, throughout the world. We see that. Marriage is a very important and central thing to most societies and cultures. It was a happy, it was a joyous occasion. You didn't want to miss it, especially if you were invited. So we also see throughout ancient Israel that no matter what level or station in life, income, tax bracket, whatever you were in, when someone was getting married, you would put on a feast according to your ability to put on a feast and invite whoever you wanted to invite. And unlike today, where the bride is probably the de facto center of the wedding, back then it was the groom. Either way, all levels of society took this very seriously. Wedding feast, you come. So Jesus tells this parable. Parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. 
the parable takes something that everybody knew and understood in, in a wedding feast. They definitely knew and understood. It takes that, and then it brings in a spiritual concept, a spiritual reality that maybe isn't so readily understood. It puts them next to each other and draws the conclusion for us. Up to this point, these three parables are talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is God's ruling activity. Jesus is sharing with us some wonderful truths about the kingdom of God. But sadly, as Jesus has been making this argument to the religious leaders, if you reject the kingdom of God, it will be taken away. There will come a time when the kingdom of God is gone from you. And that is sad. It's incredibly sad. At the same time, we see the Lord so willing to reach them that he is bringing and upping the intensity of the parables to get their attention. So they re-examine themselves and what they think about God and the kingdom and all these other matters. So Jesus, the stakes are upped. And he's not just talking about any wedding. He's talking about the wedding of the king's son, let's just say the crown prince. Now, in ancient cultures where a king rules and you live in the land of the king and therefore what the king says is law... I think it would be an uh, understatement of the day to say if the king invited you to the wedding of his son, you would come. You would go. Yet we're told in the text that the king's particular people that were invited, very simply put, were not willing to come. That does seem a little strange to refuse the generosity of the king. You would probably think that if one were to refuse the generosity of the king, something of the utmost importance must be pressing down on them that they can't get out of. They've got to, can't make the king's feast because this event is too big. So again, notice the subtle change in the verses now. The first invitation refused. The second invitation comes, but there's more. This is a very, very personal invitation from the king. The parable says, see, I, the king, have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle and killed them. Come to the wedding. This is huge. The king is dictating personal Uh, words to his servants to send the message out he's using i he's using my the king wants you to come to his table to the feast of his son wow now if there was a misunderstanding for some reason the invitation came the first time and somebody said well i don't even know if that's from the king this would clear it up this would totally clear it up verse five continues this but they that made light, but they made light of it, those invited, and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized the servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. Shocking. This is a very shocking response to an invitation from the king to attend the wedding feast of his son. But what this shocking response is showing that this wasn't an accident. There was no misunderstanding to why the invitation of the king was rejected. This is premeditated rejection. I don't want you, king, to interfere with my life, my daily schedule, and what I'm doing. You're not a priority. So we see the invitation is turned away. People went on to do their normal thing that they normally do. To reject the invitation of the king is, in all reality, to reject the king himself. Biggest cultural event happening of the year, maybe of the decade, and the people didn't care that were invited. It wasn't an understandable emergency. It's just that the invitation didn't really matter. So what, king? So what about your son, and so what about your feast? I've got my own life to attend to. We're even told, worsely, some of the king's servants were treated wickedly. Now remember, this is a parable. Jesus is teaching us something very, very particular about when the invitation goes out and how there are those and the way they treat the invitation that God sends out to people. The way some react to this gracious invitation to this feast to become part of his kingdom and his children. The application is totally apparent. And the religious leaders would not have missed this at all. The Jewish people are the A-listers. They're the first ones invited. They're the ones that receive the covenant of grace going all the way back to Mount Sinai. They're the descendants of Abraham who God chose that the Savior would come through and be a blessing to all nations. And yet many, as we see through the history of the children of Israel, rejected God. They shrugged their shoulders in indifference to God. They paid little attention to him, and even prophets were stoned and killed for bringing that message. This parable is one of Jesus' last attempts to turn these people around and listen to him. You see the king's reaction to the wickedness in verse 7. 
But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. Sounds a lot like the parable of the landowner. Here you've got it with a word of judgment. Those who rejected it, it was taken away. Now, though, this parable continues, and it's pretty exciting how it continues. The parable continues, and now, if you're an A-lister, the very opposite of being an A-lister is being an anybody. So now the king says to the servants, go and invite anybody, anybody you see, wherever you find them, bring them to my banquet hall. I want it filled. So the point of the parable is the same thing that you saw in in, in the other past parable. You're seeing those that had the most advantages, the ones that would be the logical assumption who would get it, don't get it. They aggressively pursue. They ultimately seek to destroy Jesus. Or so they thought. What we see even greater is that God would take death, mankind's attempt to get rid of his son, and he would use the death of his son as the ultimate and final deliverance. That in death, Jesus destroys the power of sin and death and taking his life again on the third day brings life to all those that believe in him. God be praised. In his resurrection, he brings life and light to all those who believe in Jesus Christ. And this includes is the parable is showing us the most unlikely of people, most unlikely of individuals. We take great comfort in the fact that the gospel has called us, that the gospel has called you, that God has sought you and sent his gracious invitation to you. It overwhelmingly fills your heart to the point of spilling over that you have been loved by the all-powerful God who holds the heavens and the earth together in his hand, that Jesus found you in your weakness, found you in your brokenness, found you in your lostness and brought you to him and applied his righteousness to you and put his spirit living in your heart, giving you purpose, giving you love. Now, though, in verse 11, the parable takes an interesting twist, keeping, though, with the theme of it. Look at verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many, this has been kind of a difficult part to understand in the parable. It seems like a massive overreaction to being underdressed to go to a wedding. However, and I used to be pretty confused on that until I read somewhere that there was a custom, especially if the king would invite you to a wedding, he would provide the clothing for you to wear there. So he would provide what you were supposed to wear and give you some kind of robe. So the guests could come as they were, stop whatever they're doing, come into the wedding feast, and then they could celebrate with the king as he provides the garments for them to wear. So the king in the parable is totally insulted because this individual is saying, I don't need what you're going to offer me to be a guest at your table. He's not respecting the king. He's not respecting the way the king is doing his own business. His own clothes is, in essence, good enough. Again, you can see the application. You can see the application. The king comes to him and asks him why he's not wearing it. The man is silent. He's disrespecting the king. He's disrespecting his, his offer. And the point that the Lord is making to us is our own righteousness, our own good works are not good enough. We can't come to God as we are. We can't stand in his presence. Isaiah said that in the scripture lesson. Sin has tainted us. It's defiled us. It's made us unacceptable to God. God has to change us. God has to cover us. God has to put on us the robe of righteousness or Jesus' righteousness transferred to us. And what an amazing truth and reality. This is exactly what the Lord has done. This is exactly why Jesus came into the world to take dead, lost sinners and turn them into children of God. So we see clearly our righteousness is from God. We see clearly that the Lord sends out the invitation into all the world, drawing people back to himself. We see the love that he has for us, that his son would give his life so we can live. In his name we pray.